Hi everyone, it's Toby here. Welcome to the podcast. The episode I recorded with Maeve Long contained so much exciting material, but I had no choice but to split it into two parts. So without further ado, here's part one. Hello and welcome to another episode of Radio Miles. I'm your host, Toby Harris, and this podcast mission is to entertain, intrigue, and maybe change a perspective on the figure known as Flan O'Brien, aka Miles Nagopolin, aka Brian O'Nolan. Thank you very much to Birkbeck College, University of London, for supporting this podcast. So my guest for this episode is Maeve Long, twice winner of the prize for the best book length work on Flan O'Brien, aka The Big Fart. Maeve is central to Flann O'Brien studies. Of course, she also has a much broader range of interests, such as in the modernism of Oceania. Day to day, Maeve is senior lecturer in the English program at the University of Waikato. Uh, I'm fully expecting that I pronounce that wrong, by the way, Maeve, so you can correct me in a minute. (laughs) Um, Did not do my homework. Um, (laughs) Her first award-winning book on Flann O'Brien was Assembling Flann O'Brien, which I would recommend as one of the best Flann starting points. The second award she picked up for giving us the collected letters of Flann O'Brien in 2018. This is the first edition of Flann's letters, and as we will talk about today, uh, one of the ways in which we can now encounter something much closer to the life behind the works of Flann O'Brien, Miles Nagopolin, etc., etc., Maeve is also one of the general editors of the Parish Review, the journal of Flann O'Brien Studies, and she is a co-editor with Matthew Hayward of New Oceania, Modernisms and Modernities in the, in the Pacific, which appeared in 2020. Recently, Maeve has combined her theoretical work on Flann with her close understanding of the way he produced his work to turn her interest to Flann and technologies of inscription, writing, typewriters, that kind of thing, which I find really fascinating as we start thinking more about the technology in the world of writers of Flann's period. Um, So Maeve, welcome to the podcast. Um, Sorry already for mispronouncing the institution's name. Is there anything else that you would add? (laughs) No, no, thank you for that lovely introduction, Toby, and I'm delighted to be speaking about Flan with you today. Um, It's a real privilege to have you here, Maeve. Um, So for for the benefit of listeners um, who may be, you know, learning about Flan O'Brien for the first time via this podcast, can you give us a thumbnail sketch uh, of of his life in in a few words? I'll, I'll give you a very brief little staccato uh, description, Toby. So uh, he's a novelist, a columnist, a playwright. He was a civil servant. He was a humorist. He was a provocateur in the sense of being often quite provoking. And he was, unfortunately, also an alcoholic. Probably the best thumbnail uh, sketch you've had so far. <laughs> so. <laughs> when was your first personal encounter with um, Flan O'Brien, Mars Nagopolin? So my mother had copies of It's Swim Two Birds and The Best of Miles in the House. Um, and she was also a student at UCD. So it was really nice to have a sense of kind of continuity between her studies and O'Nolan's studies. Obviously, she wasn't there in the 30s. Um, but she would frequently quote at some length various Keats and Chapman anecdotes from The Best of Miles. Um, and I always had this sense then that this was this kind of fascinating uh, wordsmith because obviously so many of the Keats and Chapman um, uh, pieces depend on either shaggy dog stories or kind of painfully, wonderfully uh, bad puns. Absolutely, yeah, almost um, a kind of uh, a dad joke or mum and dad joke style. (laughs) Precisely, (laughs) they're kind of of glorious in that way. I I really like how wonderfully bad they are. Though there are some letters where Flann O'Brien talks about the idea that often people would would send him in their own attempts and he said for all that it is you know they are classic bad bad dad jokes and for all that they depend on a kind of a gloriously awkward pun he felt they're actually quite hard to reproduce now how much of that's the kind of the sense of wanting to preserve one's own craft um is is moot but um yeah, they, they are an interesting example, I think, of the way in which we can push pain to humorous um, humorous ends. Punishment for picking up the newspaper and reading it in the first <laughs> place. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, the one my mother used to quote frequently was one that basically hinges on the play between Small World 
and not being a small world where Keats and Chapman just go to various countries and they keep seeing the same person and they kind of they're in Rome and they see him and they're like oh small world and then they see him in America and they're like oh wow small world and then it goes on and on and on and eventually they go to Japan and they don't see him and they're like oh big world <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's awful <laughs> but it's, it's so wonderful as well <laughs> so maybe for the benefit of our listeners who may be somewhat unacquainted with Flann O'Brien would you do us a service of reading a passage uh, that has been important to your work or that you just find really interesting so what I'm now going to read to you is the novel it's at Swim Two Birds it's his first and Maybe his most famous kind of. I think people are often split between preferring the third policeman and Swim Two Birds, but rather than reading to you a section from the published version of it, Swim Two Birds, I'm actually going to read you a section from the earliest extant typescript that we have. So this typescript is housed at the Harry Ransom Center at the University of Austin, Texas, and I have the the real pleasure and honor of being a fellow at the center uh, for the next month. So I've, I've been, I've been brought here to look at these typescripts. Um, and so I've only just begun, but I thought that this early section from what is a very pivotal part of the novel, the narrator's manifesto about how you can borrow characters and the meaning of originality mm -hmm. is particularly interesting, both for readers coming to O'Nolan and for people who are very, very familiar with the text, because this adds some extra layers to a conversation about originality and borrowing. So here we go. Characters should be interchangeable as between one book and another. The entire corpus of existing literature should be regarded as a limbo from which discerning authors could draw their characters as required, creating only when they failed to find a suitable existing creation. Could anyone devise a more abandoned villain than Claudius? Assuming the genius required to do so, would it be possible to justify the waste of space and effort involved in establishing his villainy before he is in a position to proceed to the crimes proximately required by the plot? Was it not simpler, it was asked, to say that Mr. James Hunter, gentleman, the villain of the piece, was in reality Claudius of Hamlet? That would acquaint the reader with the worst and preclude Montbanks, thimble riggers, upstarts, and persons of inferior education from an understanding of contemporary literature. Conclusion of explanation. That's very interesting, but it's all balls, Brinsley said. Do you mean that a character in a book should have a say in his destiny and be the captain of his own soul? Certainly, I said. Do you know, I don't think that's new, he said. And what's so very old about it? It's the kind of thing that occurs to everybody, but nobody bothers to try it out. Do you know what I mean? It wouldn't stand the light of day. As a matter of fact, I thought of it myself. Oh, you're a great man altogether, I said. But I did, two years ago. Well, never mind about that. I had some queer ideas myself two years ago. Here's a wad of my recentest prose. I proffered a wad of my precise typescript, bent in double, pink tinted. He took it without delight. Where did you get this? he asked. Oh, sit down and read it, man, I said. I have a lecture, you know. Can I take it with me? Yes, but listen till I tell you. It's about the legendary Finn. He's a suitable man for a role in my story. Therefore, he gets the job. That stuff is all irrelevant. It's just for atmosphere, you know, and so on. Are you listening to me? I am. I thought of it all two years ago. Wow. Okay. I'm going to try and continue to talk, even though um, as a uh, Brian and Nolan researcher, my brain is, is melting right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty exciting, isn't it? Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll fumble through, but I'm, I'm, it's going to take me a few, a few weeks to digest uh, the full significance of, of the way that is different from, from what we have currently. Right. Um, I suppose um, the, um, w the, the the thing that st strikes me most is by bringing in the um, Claudius of Hamlet um, uh, material, or by including it originally, and also by really driving home on this point that Brinsley has had this whole idea, this exact idea, mm. yeah. and maybe written the same thing two years ago. Yeah, we're moving into into that 
um, kind of um, multi-dimensional world building that you would get in a short story by Borges, maybe. It's really quite yeah. mind bending, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, it, it, it ostensibly is a better performance of the narrator's manifesto than the published version, because not only does he say, you know, you should borrow whatever characters you want, he, he, he does so himself. So, I mean, he uses Hamlet and then Brinsley quotes um, William Ernest Henley's Invictus. So we already have this sense of kind of performing what he argues of, of, of you know, using this idea. But I also really like this sense of pointing both to the context in which this was written, which is a period during which O'Nolan is collaborating a lot with his friends and is clearly sharing ideas with them. And therefore, no doubt, either engaging with or slightly concerned about the idea of, well, what does constitute originality? Like, what does constitute uh, plagiarism? And when I'm embedded in this kind of collective where ideas are being shared so much and where so many people are using pseudonyms or just writing pieces that don't have names attributed to them, how can we tell whose work is whose? And I mean, that, that will go on to be a problem for O'Nolan, a creative problem, but also a kind of a, a real difficulty later in life when Montgomery um, helps him write the Krushkin Lawn columns. So this sense of, well, whose idea is it anyway, is something that I think runs through O'Nolan's work for the rest of his life. Absolutely. And what then is the significance of cutting out this material? For in in a published version, and crucially, we're now on the theme of collaboration. Who do you believe did that edit? Do you believe that it's um, Nar Sheridan, who's represented as as Brinsley, we think, in the novel, who who made the the large scale edits to the for manuscript? It's so interesting because it's it's so hard to know. I mean, so this is the earliest extant typescript that we have, and it is quite fragmented in the sense that. Some of it is on white pieces of typed paper. Some of it is on pink paper. So, I mean, he mentions the pink tinted pages in this piece, actually. And then some of it's handwritten. But parts of it are actually shorter than the version that will eventually get published. And so we have this anecdote where Sheridan says that he was given this kind of enormous manuscript by O'Nolan and that he edited it and he reduced, I, did, I think, did he say two thirds of it? I, I can't quite remember the exact amount, but he, he definitely said he reduced it mm -hmm. really substantially. Mm -hmm. um, now he also said that a lot of what he removed was uh, O'Nolan's engagement. I don't know, parody is, is kind of, I think sometimes parody expresses a slight lack of respect. And I think O'Nolan did really respect the early Irish material, but let's use parody for the want of a better term at the moment, but the, the parody of the Fionn McCool and the Fiona cycles. Um, so whether or not what we actually have here is pre-Sheridan or post-Sheridan or kind of two stages beyond that is, is almost impossible to tell. What I had expected before I started working on this was to find even so, even if this is the post-Sheridan version, a substantially longer piece than the published one. But it's it's not quite definitively longer or shorter. Instead, it's, it's quite different. There are parts missing, there are parts added. Um, but I can imagine how it must have felt for Sheridan to read it. I mean, he's spoken that he kind of was both shocked and delighted uh, and somewhat taken aback to find himself in that Swim Two Birds. And I'm wondering if he if he really was the person who then suggested editing this or O'Nolan himself decided afterwards that it was either too close to the bone or didn't propel the plot in the way he wanted it to. But from Sheridan's perspective, I, I wonder if it did feel a little too close to a conversation that they'd had. Um, I found some archival material a few years ago in the National Library of Ireland, which shows that Sheridan wrote a piece that also features bicycles, also features rural policemen, and also has a sense of a, a shocking murder. So basically something that is incredibly close to the third policeman. But there's no letter that I, I could find. There, there is no account on record that shows either of them feeling angry with the other, either of them accusing the other of plagiarism, 
uh, either see, feeling that their story was the original story, the whole idea of I had that idea myself two years ago. So we, we have this very complicated scene of, of collaboration, of like, you know, creatively bouncing off other people, but without any sense of who had the idea first or being able to track down um, an originally, original urtext. And maybe that's okay, though. Maybe this is the point of all of this, that when you're dealing with a collaborative situation like this, there in a way is no urtext. There is no sense of, of who had the idea first, because the idea was born out of conversation between two people. And potentially then the reason O'Nolan removed this section of the, I had that uh, idea two years ago myself, was to point to the idea that that was missing the point, that that was emphasizing originality and sources in a way that the novel was trying to play with or undercut or actively reject. Yeah, that's that's so interesting. Um, I'm tempted to uh, I'm tempted to see them almost in the form of an experimentalist or avant-garde circle to some yeah. extent. Yeah. They are sometime. I think there's one instance in a in an American magazine where they are referred to the uh, the two Niles and and Brian as a circle. And I think Sheridan alludes to it to some extent when he talks about the idea they had to kind of mass produce a, a, the great yes. Irish novel yeah. and refers yeah. to them, I think, as the Irish ready-made school or something like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, this, this all becomes slightly troubled when kind of decades later, um, O'Nolan and Montgomery fall out because of what O'Nolan perceives as Montgomery's plagiarizing his his Krishki non uh, material. But I, I think first of all, we we have to allow people to to change and their ideas to differ over the course of decades. So kind of the young man of at Swim Two Birds who's playful about originality and slightly more carefree about where ideas come from is not the man kind of decades later who is depending on a column for his career, who is suffering quite um, quite badly from health complications, some related to alcohol, some simply from his, his situation. Um, so we can have continuity, but we also really need to allow for that continuity to be marked by you know, substantial changes in direction and substantial changes in mind. But it is in a way, I think, I suppose if we're going to be emotionally connected to an author and if we you know, have a sense of, of wanting his well-being, for me, it is a little bit sad to see that movement from friends who have this, this circle, who have this collective, to later on this slightly desperate need to draw lines in the sand over intellectual property, because that intellectual property is now commodified. But when, when I say that, I don't blame O'Nolan for that, because this was his career. This By this stage, he was no longer working for the civil service. So if he didn't have this money, you know, there was no income. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I agree that it's um, it's it's a shame that we do we have ended up taking that perspective when um, if you other other groups of important artists and writers have managed to retain um, the sense of working in a circle. So we would refer to Zurich Dada or Berlin mm. Dada. You know, we would refer to the circle working around Joyce uh, in transition and so on. So. We 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 it would be it, I think it is possible to reconstruct that that was that kind of circle based activity was closer to what's going on, um, and so in some senses I, I agree it's a shame that um, we we now are kind of forced by kind of battle lines drawn later to to mm. see separate. Although I, I would probably note that these kind of disputes uh, still exist, you know, within groups that really self identify as circles. So yeah. I think. There's a lot of disagreement yeah. in in Berlin Dada about who invented the the cut up you know photo montage technique, and I I believe the inventor is more likely to have been Hannah Hook, um, mm. but that 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 claim was taken by others. So even in the most circle of circles, you know, there's disagreement. <laughs> exactly. I mean, we all want this kind of very utopian sense of of 
a collective where everything is shared and ideas just kind of flow freely and everyone can, you know, I mean, that kind of, yeah, a, a perfect version of, of, of communist intellectualism. <laughs> but once, of course, we understand what happened to intellectualism and the realities of communism and so on, all mm -hmm. of these things unfortunately become kind of tainted or, or broken down by, by lived realities without, of course, in any way implying that we then have a situation where capitalism is inevitable. Yes, yes, of course, of course, yeah. yeah need, need to include that. Um, very Benjaminian. Um, okay, so um, um, uh, we, we, you've brought to light, you know, quite an unprecedented level of insight into these, not only collaborations, but so much, so many other aspects of the biographical, you know, Brian Lolan and his life by um, pulling together um the the letters that we have into a collected edition um and um i our listeners might not be familiar but with this but the publication of a, a set of collected letters is is a is a landmark in our to, in a, a signal of the world's interest in a particular writer so you know um that it's very very important events you know when when those editions appear if you think of uh, James Joyce or Samuel Beckett, um, alongside whom um, Brian O'Nolan is often now put. Um, but um, it, it also seems like a monumental task that can take many, many years. You know, there's, there's for example, the, the, the letters of Samuel Beckett extend to many volumes um, and has that project um, has, has been ongoing for, for a long time. Um, so can you just give our listeners a sense of what is it like to set out to undertake a task as as, as large as that um and what's the um how diff how difficult is it to do that like something that strikes me is how do you strike the balance between footnoting something um in a factual way and providing commentary that's really necessary or like when do you have to make key choices about what date am i going to put something where am i going to be drawn on this because really your letters produce a much more accurate biography of the writer than, than we've had so far too oh thank you toby yeah it is it is a tricky undertaking i mean to begin with, it's a huge amount of detective work. You, you spend a lot of time trying to track down letters whose existence is presumed but never definite. So you have the obvious locations, like the main archives. So you're like, you know, you have a, a core body of work that you know you can rely on. But from then, it's just a lot of tendrils, some of which will turn out to be dead ends, some of which will often kind of in the minority, but but turn out to be something wonderful and exciting. So you, you do spend a lot of time kind of trying to check archives just to see if there's anything there. Um, Frank McNally of the Irish Times was also really good in advertising the search in his, his pages in the Irish Times. And so that produced some really interesting letters. A few people through that also contacted me um, who had purchased letters, and um, this is it, we're also contending with people who have privately purchased letters and are happy for them to be in their own homes. Um, and I, 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 as much as I want everything to be freely available to scholars, I, I'm not at this point going to kind of absolutely object to people feeling that they have uh, a certain right to protect or retain the letters that they purchased. Um, but I was hugely grateful to people who, having purchased letters themselves, did actually make them available to me and gave me permission to reproduce them. I don't doubt that there's still letters in people's houses that they know about, maybe that they have framed and that are kind of, you know, prized possessions, or letters that are in people's attics, letters that have been kind of purposefully or accidentally destroyed. So there's always this kind of tantalizing sense of that the letters that are just out of reach, the letters that you imagine but that don't have. I mean, I know that there were a huge amount of letters between O'Nolan and the Irish Times because, you know, when he sent in his columns, presumably he would have had some kind of note with them. And since we know that he had so many disagreements, often with the way these pieces were copy edited, we, there would have been back and forths of him maybe kind of in a very entertaining fashion, like yelling at the, the editors. Mm -hmm. But when the Irish Times moved um, uh, locations in Dublin, they destroyed a lot of files, so those, those are gone. Um, I also know that Evelyn destroyed some personal letters, which she has you know, every right to do. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I suppose this is also the part where the, there's a danger that researchers can seem like vultures or kind of people who, who just 
feel entitled to own or have access to every aspect of a person's private life. And as an academic, I'm deeply sympathetic to the idea that everything relates to the work, that, that there is no aspect of an author's life that I, I won't be interested and won't think in some way impacts what they've written, while also thinking that the act of creative writing or the act of publishing does not, not deny you a private life and does give you the, the right to withhold what you need to withhold or what your relatives think is information that they have a certain private access to and that doesn't need to be made public. That said, I should say that the estate, um, O'Nolan's estate is under his, his wife's name, so the estate of Evelyn O'Nolan have been extremely helpful and were very, very um, very positive in, in my dealings with them. And so the only thing that we censored was the name of, of one still living individual. Other than that, they, they didn't ask for anything else to, to be stricken from the record. And so I'm, I'm really grateful to them for that. Yes, and it's, and it's worth... Um... And it's worth noting in, in passing that um, for people listening who are interested in research into Flann O'Brien, that um, in, in a way that's quite markedly evolved, I think, from the evolution of James Joyce studies and Samuel Beckett studies, um, it's always been a very open um, society. You know, so yeah. the journal yeah. has been published as an open access resource really from the beginning, but is now fully, you know, gold standard open access. So there's yeah. a wealth of material. And in that sense, we can be very grateful for the estate because now whenever they're authorizing for new material to appear or be published, it's in an open access way, you know, which is um, when it's going to be published in that journal. Um, and that's that's something I, I find quite interesting. Um, it's almost could be something in future that could be studied on its own. You know, what difference does that make to the discipline that so much of the material is available to anyone with an internet connection? Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I think it's it's down to the, the generosity and I think forward thinking of an estate uh, when they do that because estates operate very differently and with very different expectations of the line between the public and the private or the open access and the commercial. And so I, I think that we're very lucky that we have the, the estate of Evelyn O'Nolan that we have. Absolutely. Um, so what a, t could you tell me anything about the kinds of people that are likely to, to, to have letters, to, to have collected that, that kind of material? Um, who, are they, who are these people? Or do they, do they know um, Brian and Nolan? Are they, are they collectors? Like, what, what is this world of shadowy world of, of letter collectors? <laughs> I'll, I'll answer this as best I can, because it's one of those questions where I, I only know the people I've engaged with and I don't doubt that there are more. So it's, it's kind of an, an answer based on extrapolation and, and speculation. Um, but this makes sense for people in Ireland, for, for, for people out of, outside of Ireland, it, it might be slightly more surprising because O'Nolan isn't that well known often outside of Ireland, though his, his reputation is, I think, really, really growing. But I mean, to an extent, I... I I don't know, I, I kind of hate the expression national treasure, and I, I think O'Nolan would have just found it utterly ridiculous. But if you can have a national treasure who is an incredibly cantankerous, slightly aggressive, but also very humorous man with health conditions and addictions that make him irascible and, um, um, yeah, a, a challenge sometimes to deal with, then then he's a, a national treasure. I mean, <laughs> he's no Judy Dench. But <laughs> does it does it maybe say something about Ireland that that is the case? <laughs> this, this, this is the national treasure. He's not very much like the British national treasure. <laughs> <laughs> but so I, I think for a lot of people, uh, having a letter by this man who is an amazing national figure, who. It's kind of then, I suppose, um, an anti-institutional institution, you know, I mean, part of the civil service, but also, and, and in a way, very good at his job, but also kind of despising of the job and increasingly um, aggressive about the tasks that he had to do. So of the civil service, but opposed to the civil service, kind of a novelist who wrote novels that play with the very idea of what constitutes the kind of the right of the author and the power of the author who was a columnist in a newspaper, but not a journalist. So doing this kind of social commentary that's also literary commentary and that's kind of literary criticism, but not. So because of this, this position of, of being 
part of things, but a very destabilizing presence in so many of them. Mm -hmm. I think that really appeals to a lot of Irish people. And so I, I think those who could afford to um, buy letters often bought them for precisely that reason, for for the joy of having in your home, perhaps, I know, I know some of them were uh, framed and kind of put on the wall. Yeah, so having on your walls kind of the actual signature, the actual mark of this author who both gave us so much but was so skeptical or questioning of of the nature of these these institutions wow what an exciting and groundbreaking discussion if like me your head is still spinning then stay tuned because in part two, we're going to talk about Flann O'Brien and technology and listen to his voice as you have never heard him before. See you next time.